we have we are ex extremely lucky because we have not three but four uh, panelists because they really represent um, the diversity uh, of uh, of projects and contributors that uh, we had during this Open COVID nineteen initiative. Um, first is uh, Rachel uh, Aronoff, and she's uh, she's uh, the the now what. She's going to introduce herself, but uh, she's been uh, a member of this community uh, since the very beginning, uh, and uh, and she's been doing leading amazing initiatives around uh, biotechnology and uh, and especially diagnostics tests. Uh, we have uh, Robert uh, Robert Reed, um, who is also a um, person very active in the community, working around uh, specifically hardware and uh, and medical devices, and she's going he's going to. Uh, Tell us more about that. We have Joshua Moore, uh, who is a, a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Cardiff, and uh, he's been also uh, part of this community recently. He joined through the round five of the micro grants. And finally, we have Marcelo Giovannetti, uh, who is part of the AXA Research Fund. And, and this, this is very important for us that we have someone from the AXA Research Fund because uh, they've been uh, the one making this happen. Uh, they are the, the main funder of the Open COVID-19 initiative. They have trusted Drogo and the community to make this happen. And so um, it's, I think it's very important that we get to have their perspective um, regarding this program. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to this amazing panel. Um, um, before, before, before we start, make sure that if uh, you're not speaking, that everybody is muted and, uh, and uh, Without further ado, let me stop my screen sharing so that we get to see everyone. Perfect. Um, so first of all, I'm going to ask every member of this panel to introduce themselves. First, I would like to start with Rachel. Uh, hello, Rachel. Hi, nice to see you. Great to have this celebration here for Jogo. So my name's Rachel Aronoff. I'm the founder of a... Um, public health organization, one could call it, um, AGIR, Action for Genomic Integrity Through Research, which is all about um, finding ways to avoid risks to health from the many things we choose to do. Of course, there are lots of risks we can't avoid at all, but I'm also president of the Open Public Lab Aquarium, or in the French pronunciation would say aquarium to sort of highlight this idea of open science and sharing like, like a fishbowl, the, the transparency and the, um, learning new things together. Um, here in Switzerland, I'm in one of part of our open public lab. This is our P1 room here, and um, it's really great to be part of this Jogo adventure. Excellent. Could you introduce actually the project you've been working on within Open COVID-19? Yes, of course. We've been doing quite a lot in terms of um, accessible diagnostic tools, molecular diagnostics for the virus, um, based on a sort of molecular amplification strategy. So there were at least four Jogal projects that were involved in developing specific molecular tests for the virus, and ours is called Corona Detective. And it was inspired by the GMO detective, which was actually a project that came out of the Cree with Guy Lepper. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other people. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Um, um, next, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from, from you, Rob. Um, could you introduce yourself and tell us more about the project you've been leading uh, within the initiative? Sure. So my name is uh, Rob, uh, Robert L. Reed. Um, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm really kind of a glorified computer programmer. Um, I'm the founder of Public Invention, which invents in the public for the public. So we try to make open source hardware inventions. Um, I'm also a board member of Helpful Engineering, which is a different but highly aligned nonprofit uh, that is, is similar. Both of those organizations are kind of similar to Jogal in, in some of the things um, that they do. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I have personally been associated with five projects which were given Jogo micro grants recently um, uh, through either helpful engineering or public invention. For public invention, there's the OX, which is an oxygen concentrator. Um, and there is a uh, project Polyvent, which is an attempt to make a bellows-based 
ventilator with helpful engineering, there is VentOS, which is an attempt to make a software open source platform for any ventilation system. Um, there's also a transport ventilator called Open Vent Bristol and a uh, ventilation splitter called Project Tetra. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, and then um, to Joshua. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Josh. Um, I'm a second year PhD student here at Cardiff where I study maths. And usually I'd be working on developing models to understand the initial stages of breast cancer formation. But over the last year or so, uh, Thomas Woolley in the audience, um, my supervisor and I, have been working on several uh, COVID-19 related projects. We're using maths to model different uh, infection transmission events in various scenarios, in particular looking at um, public spaces. And so uh, we, over the last couple of months, we found Joggle, so we've joined the, the community and now are working on a project to develop a online uh, software um, tool for policymakers to use our models to reduce that lag time between decisions and um, and modeling and using different parameter space, those types of ideas, wrapping all that into some software. Awesome. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, we have Marcelo um, from AXA Research from Marcelo. Um, are you here? Yes, hi. I'm hi. Um, thanks for having me and, uh, and happy birthday. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, I'll just so I'm Marcelo Giovanetti. I am a project and partnerships manager at the Axel Research Fund, uh, particularly on um, research projects in economics, but also uh, on uh, open science. Um, so just to give you an overview of the research fund, we basically started in 2008 um, with the philanthropic arm of of Axel, um, the global insurer. Um, and we really started to address, you know, the challenges our planet uh, faces today through uh, academic research. Um, so since 2008, um, we've given about 250 million euros uh, to uh, 660 projects um, in 320 different um, uh, academic institutions. So we fund research normally along three different themes, which are all around risk. This is environment, health and, and economics. So it's kind of one part of our mission. A second part of our mission is to bring science out of the lab. Um, and this is really when it comes to, you know, science dissemination, fostering collaboration between academia and ACCEP in particular, but also within the insurance industry, and then sharing knowledge, um, you know, with society at large, key decision makers. Um, I'll just add that kind of one of our driving ideas behind the research fund is, you know, ACCEP's broader purpose of acting for human progress by, you know, protecting what matters. So a lot of it is kind of, funding um, academic, public academic uh, research that can, you know, lead to advance human progress um, and, and help, you know, prevent and inform uh, risk. Um, just to say as well that, you know, since 2016, um, open research and open access has been a, a key value for the research fund. Um, so, you know, we really believe that free and, uh, and unrestricted access to, you know, the scientific outputs and the research projects that we fund uh, is actually a fundamental uh, part of our mission. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, just from hearing this session before, you know, we also, you know, have this big community that we're also, you know, trying to, to work on, on engaging a bit more and, you know, particularly interested in, in you know, these innovative research methods, which is basically what led us to, <laughs> to this project. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Um, yeah, um, maybe as a uh, as a throw up question, um, like you you started explaining it, but um, what has been um, like your your experience? Because you've mostly used to uh, to, to fund um, academic uh, research projects uh, or academic shares, um, and so being able to uh, to fund um, this. Um, open community is, I think, definitely a first, not only for the access research fund, but I, I would say probably like for almost any research funds uh, out there. Um, and uh, so uh, what, 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 um, like, what made you want actually to, uh, to fund this, this community and uh, what has been like your, um, your main uh, take home message in terms of, okay, actually this is uh, maybe uh, uh, fully legit uh, and uh, do we need to uh, maybe uh, 
change, um, you know, uh, or consider uh, like a new category, you know, of uh, of contributors to, uh, to science. Yeah, no, no, I think I think that's a good that's a good point. You know, traditionally we fund academic institutions, as you said, so we're dealing with kind of very um, traditional, you know, research methods uh, within, you know, very high level uh, academic institutions, and I think. One of the things that really um, attracts us to Drogo and the work, you know, is this kind of disruptive and, and collaborative way uh, of working that can that can lead to quicker solutions because academic research is <laughs> notoriously uh, slow. Uh, so it can lead to quicker and more, and more agile solutions. And I think this is exactly what we saw with you know the the, the COVID nineteen open COVID nineteen project. Um, when you know when the crisis first started. We, we were kind of figuring out, you know, what, what could we do? Um, so we immediately, you know, earmarked about 5 million euros uh, to give to, to different institutions. So, you know, we were kind of one of the early funders of the Bastille Institute, you know, the French Medical Research Foundation, French Red Cross, um, the, the Parisian hospitals. So these are all kind of very traditional institutions. Um, and, and then we also kind of, you know, did some uh, uh, special awards. Uh, to uh, researchers based on institutions. But I think what really we were looking at was how can we have more on the ground, uh, quick solutions that are really necessary during uh, a crisis like this. So really the idea that, you know, the Open COVID-19 project was focusing on that sort of prevention, uh, you know, detection, treatment, um, but really looking at how we can make, you know, PPE more accessible, uh, these kind of low cost solutions. And, you know, I think this was already in line with the kind of innovative uh, innovation that we want to bring to the research community, which is, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, open platforms and, and, and prototyping promising equipment. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, I, I have to say it's, it's been such a blessing to work with, uh, with the AXA Research Fund because you guys have been um, listening to the kind of needs and and you know uh, especially need of agility um, that is definitely um, something that institutions are not used to. Like we work with uh, such a brewing uh, community and 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 I think it's sufficiently rare uh, important to 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 remark that uh, you guys are being so reactive uh, when when we need you. So so th thank you for that. Um, and uh, um, that. Next, the next question is uh, is going to be for um, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, you know, uh, Open COVID nineteen is uh, is fundamentally a community driven initiative, and uh, and and so you have you have you have told us about about your project around diagnostics. Um, but obviously, diagnost the diagnostic tests uh, that you've been working on is not the only uh, diagnostic tests uh, that have been going in the in the in the community. So, could you tell us like how uh, like Jogo in its like infrastructure and community has been truly helpful for you and your project like, to, to really move forward the problem that you were trying to solve? So yeah, without Open Jogo's um, funding and so on, probably this open public lab would never have had the opportunity to do the sort of molecular diagnostics that we set out to do. And we were so fortunate to be able to manage to make the equipment work. We had to hack an old uh, real-time PCR machine to get the initial data and double check how our primers worked. And we had to order special tags um, primers and we also wanted to compare to the other kinds of diagnostic tests that are out there. So um, for instance, if somebody had a positive test with the RT-PCR, would they get showed up on our corona detective was a very interesting thing to do. And recently we got some real inactivated virus to use as positive controls. And we could also take that and put it on the quick uh, auto antigen test that the Swiss government lets you get for basically for free. And um, you could actually really quantify the number of virion copies that um, those tests see versus the number of virion copies that corona detected sees. And um, it was really quite nice to um, know that we were like over 2,500 fold more sensitive than this antigen test that's used for the, well, it's really to find the people who are the super spreaders. 
but um, I, 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 I guess maybe more specifically, um, um, because this is fascinating, but like how, how have you been interacting with the other diagnostics projects and, and like the community? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So really it, it is the colleagues getting pulled together in the Slack channel of the project nucleic acid um, amplification that really pushed us to all do a lot more work than we would have ever expected possible. Not just here in this little open lab, but all over the place. We have colleagues now in Chile, colleagues, I, I thought we were gonna show the picture in Tacoma, but um, there, there, there is a picture of what, what the output of our corona detective looks like and a whole bunch of people who made this all possible. And so besides the colleagues, the feedback on the Slack channel very quickly and the sort of collaboration with Guy, of course, who had developed the GMO detective, and then we based the same method with the special primers for the virus to, to make corona detective work. But the fact that it was decentralized, all open access, and it wasn't just the funding, it was this open development that made it so special, and we were so glad to be part of it. Yes, um, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been... Um such an amazing uh, creative adventure. And uh, I would like to ask the same question to, uh, to, to, uh, to Rob. Um, so uh, in fact, Rob and Joshua, you can actually uh, uh, answer that question right one after the other. Um, you've joined the, the community more recently than, than Rachel, um, but um, you, you've joined the, the community through the open peer, review, uh, open peer reviewing round. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, what what did you gain by joining Jogo? Uh, I was like, obviously um, the funding, but like also beyond the funding itself. Um, well, so I think for the teams that I work with, like Ben Coombs on the Ox and uh, Open Ben Bristol and these other, it, it was a vote of confidence from the community um, that the the projects had value. Um, and, and that's one of the beautiful things about the community peer review process, which is very different than the academic process where in general, the academics value the, the ability to get publications and to do interesting things. The fact that something is beneficial to the world is of less importance if it's not academically interesting in that environment. And so I'd, I'd like to thank Marcelo and, and his organization for making the peer reviewed micro grant process possible. I'd also like to just point out an observation. Um, many of the people who work on these projects are relatively highly paid, but getting two or three thousand dollars or two or three thousand euros, it, it's kind of like you gave them thirty thousand dollars in terms of their motivation, even though you're, you're, you're just buying them equipment that they probably could have bought themselves. The, the motivational impact of that funding is, is really quite tremendous. Um, now, uh, I have to admit, I have not used the Slack channel at Jogal as much as I probably should have because I'm a part of Helpful Engineering and Public Invention. And we, we kind of have our own uh, volunteer network. But it may be that Jogal will become a global community of volunteers who can democratize this kind of research. And I, I certainly su support that happening. Um, I guess from my perspective, um, coming from this with just with one project, the peer review kind of uh, system you have here was fantastic for us to understand how to develop our, our kind of product into a very general product, very user friendly product, because we came from a very isolated kind of um, community of me and Thomas developing these types of models. But the, the idea of our project was to make it globally accessible. You need to be able to use this tool regardless of where you are, your kind of technical background. And that kind of peer review process really enlightened us to understand, okay, these are the kind of aspects we need to focus on to make sure they're completely crystal clear, make sure everyone knows where we are in terms of our kind of terminology and things like that. Um, but also coming now into the, the community as we're kind of closing, uh, closing the project, we're getting continuous support from the Joggle team for promotion of our, our application, as well as uh, a call for volunteers for us to, to work with them as, as we run out of funding and work on this in our spare time type of thing. So 
it, it's a fantastic community to be in for these short term projects because these things won't get done any other way. So having that flash funding to get these projects done is just fantastic for these types of COVID related problems. I, I'd like to second that. The speed of flash funding is incredibly important. The, you know, there are philanthropies that, that provide large amounts of money, but if you have to go through a six month grant process to get it and you have a worldwide pandemic, it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something that we're we're um, that was a plan, and we're uh, happy that the plan worked. <laughs> um, so, um, looking at the time, we have um, just I would ask a, a, a last question to all of you, and uh, and if the time agrees with uh, with us, uh, we'll also be taking questions from the, from the crowd. So, um, get ready and and write your questions in the chat if you want to. Um, the last question is um, just simply what's um, What's next for, for you and your project? Um, how do you see actually uh, this project going uh, f uh, forward? And uh, what would you like maybe the Juggle community or Juggle actually to, uh, to help you with? Did you want me to start again? Um, <laughs> please, please, Rachel. <laughs> okay, so next going forward for Corona Detective is really the big push for getting our clinical trial validation of the, the method and the, the really getting standardized production at scale so we can actually have a reliable, the same for every batch to batch, you don't have a ton of variability, which is what is possible with just small batches being freeze dried at the cream. And so we're really looking forward and talking to big companies, experts in freeze drying right now. Um, there's one in America that uh, we really think we're gonna get our proof of principle batch very soon. And so we, we really are exploring the, these avenues for at scale standardized production and trying to really get to a point where these inexpensive diagnostics can be used in places they're most needed. Awesome. We're so much looking forward to this. Um, and um, I guess that next would be um, um, either Rob or Rushwa who wants to go next. Yeah, I, so I'll, I'll just speak. These will be technical answers. Um, on the ox, the, um, the, the public invention oxygen concentrator, what we're trying to do is to get the pre-dehydration um, working so that it's a really solid and well-tested solution. Uh, it's a highly open source solution, but it's not really ready for production right now because it needs dehumidification. We're, we're moving forward with that. Um, I, on a second note, which might not mean anything to anybody, but it will show what we're doing. I'm flying to Montreal this weekend, assuming COVID doesn't prevent me from doing so, to work with the engineer making the ventilator to take the VentOS software system and embed it for the first time on that hardware system. So the, the money given to VentOS is, is promoting the idea of an ongoing open source ventilation platform, which others are free to use. Now, sadly, no one except the Polyvent system is choosing to use it right now, but I'm hoping that I can build momentum uh, behind that, that project. Awesome. Joshua? Yeah, um, so for us, the first build of our application is, is kind of finished. And now we're in the rounds for feedback. So that's feedback from our kind of study groups from uh, the policy makers that we're kind of working with our colleagues, as well as just the general audience. So Thomas, uh, Thomas Woolley, the, the other member of our team just linked the, the application in the chat. Um, so basically we're looking for as much feedback as we can use it, try and break it for us really. We need this thing to be as robust as possible. We're testing it continuously, but there's always something and anyone working in web development coding will know there will be something somewhere. Um, so the feedback basically for us is our next step of just iterations until we get that polished product um, for the policy makers. Awesome. And, uh, um, and then I'm going to ask Marcelo, um, like what, what do you think this um, COVID pandemic has uh, uh, taught the, the, the AXA research fund? Like, do you feel like um, you're changing part of your strategy for the way you want to, uh, to, to, to work? Uh, you know, you, you, 
it's it's related to what you've already been saying, but um, maybe to, to 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 summarize it in a in a in a concise way for for everyone here. I think it's it's so important as a as a good model for of course project probably also other funds. Yeah, I think um, I think just by you know kind of our inherent nature, we still have to really stick to traditional ways of of funding research. But I think it's been a really good example, and it's been a really good lesson to to really tap into our you know community of researchers because Utoma you know have been funded as as a as a fellow from the research fund, um, and kind of really listening to our researchers um, because I think you know if we go with them, they can really take us outside of the box, um, as long as that research is, is true to our mission and to our broader purpose. So so the pandemic, this project has really taught us to to kind of. There can be alternatives to traditional funding, and you know we can act, um, you know, uh, agilely. I guess you could say, um, to to support different types of research. Yeah, um, we are looking very much toward this, and um, and um, yeah, it's it's it, we're definitely uh, at the beginning of a, of a new era. Uh, I think uh, we a lot of actors that were, um, you know, somehow in in the background for for so long has. Really, raised up during the pandemic and 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 made you know so much happen that uh, now they're legitimate. Uh, and so we, it's it's really it's really important to uh, to 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 make their voice still heard and and that we can really uh, enable us to enable them to um, to stand to stand them up and 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 uh, and and give them uh, opportunities to uh, to act. Um, so so this is this is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, um, the idea is if you have questions um, in the crowd please ask them now. Uh, you can either write them in the chat and we'll read them for you, or you can just um, unmute yourself and speak. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll just end it here. Um, so <laughs> Chris, Chris is asking, uh, I think, a, a nice question. Uh, what's your dream for the future of open science? <laughs> in, a, in a few words. Uh. <laughs> it's an easy one. <laughs> we want to democratize research so everyone has access to a community lab somewhere near where they live. Huh? That's the best way. You get your hands in there and you learn and then it makes sense. There, of course, everyone should get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> So I'd like to answer that as well, though I'm not the scientist that Rachel is. Um, from an engineering point of view, I would like to see what we might call public invention or perhaps humanitarian engineering would be a broader name for it, be a third pole that arises. If, if we think about the last hundred years, for-profit firms have done amazing things and universities have done amazing things. And those are sort of the two sources of intellectual input to our society. I would like to see what you might call amateur science or open source inventing or open source thing, not replace those, but be a third pole mm -hmm. to those. And I would like it to be professionally possible for someone to enter government service and then work at a university research lab and then spend a little bit of time working for a nonprofit in an open source environment and then go back and work for a large corporation and, and make a lot of money and, and move between those fields uh, easily. I think if we could accomplish that, um, we would really be entering the next century with a, a different model. Can I agree more? Um, Joshua? Yeah, I, I completely agree with what everyone's just said, particularly with the community aspect, having a community around you to develop a community around you so you can have that freedom just to talk about ideas all the time and just have the exposure to different types of ideas. But I feel like at the moment it's too high up. You have to get quite high up in the system to develop these types of communities, to develop the tools to, to talk to, talk about these types of ideas. So it's the idea of trickling this this community aspect down. Don't, don't put it on this kind of ivory pedestal of you have to have a certain degree to, to talk about these things. No, it's trickle this down to all the way down to high school. As long as you get the, the technical language, once you kind of get the fun, fundamental understanding, that, that's all you need to, to kind of do science. Very good point. And um, finally, Marcelo, what, what is uh, the dream of open science for the AXA Research Fund? Uh, I think, um, no, 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 I, I agree with, with what the, the other panelists have said. 
um, I think it's really, yeah, you know, really making um, fast, uh, transparent research uh, uh, open to all. Um, I think, you know, this is exactly what we saw with, with this pandemic and, and uh, you know, it's a shame it took a pandemic for us to realize uh, how important it was. So I, I guess for me, the future is just for it to be the norm um, for the next crisis. <laughs> Yeah, let's 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 be ready for the next one. There will be no, there will be other ones. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Wait, can I just add one last point? Oh, like, sure, I, yes. There was, there was one last thing that I don't think we touched on is in terms of open science is science without borders. There was a a, a recent um, uh, study done, and because of Brexit, Britain has lost over a billion pounds in research funding. That's insane. <laughs> Um, Britain is a powerhouse of researchers. We have amazing people here, but because of Brexit, they're not being put on bids. So we need things like this to, Britain's not failing by any means, but we need to get past this idea of imaginary lines on a map. I think uh, sums up, Thomas, thank you. That was the beautiful way also to summarize uh, everything that's happening now. Um, it's really breaking the, the frontiers, uh, the walls um, of, uh, of institutions, um, of, um, of disciplines, and uh, really, really, really make, making, uh, providing anyone with an equal chance of uh, taking the initiative. Um, so um, thank, you, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for this amazing panel. We'll be coming back to the main room and uh, to just uh, finalize the event and celebrate this uh, beautiful birthday. Uh, so see you in the main room. Thank you for all. We are now uh, waiting for the other panel to finish. Um, I believe they should be done extremely soon. You want to show the picture with all the people that I didn't get to show them? <laughs> please, Rachel. Uh, please, absolutely. No, can I? I don't know if I can find. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> I sent this to you. Oh, well, where is it? No, no, it's on the other. It's in the room. <laughs> oh, it's somewhere in the Slack. <laughs> um, so we'll wait uh, one one more minute. Uh, if not, what I will be doing is I will be uh, bringing everyone uh, have the power of closing the rooms, <laughs> just to make sure that everyone is synchronized. But I'm sure I'm sure they will be uh, they will be ready. Aha, uh -huh, I found it. Cool. Show, show, show it to us. Okay, there it is. And then I have to come back here. And now, I, so now I can share screen. Okay. You can, yes. Okay, good. This one. Okay, so this was just because I was really planning to talk a lot about how everybody was so amazing. So there's Guy, who's now left Paris and is in Israel. There's me and Sam, who helped me hack the big beast in Hackerarium. There's Ellen Jorgensen, Sarah um, in Chicago, <laughs> Fernan in Chile, Toma, Scott, we're missing Ali, there's Fran, there's people in Sri Lanka, and I think there's Sarah Vint also, but in Berlin actually. And um, the other people that really should be mentioned are Katrin in Germany, um, Ali in Berkeley, this academic guy Zeth, who's at UC Berkeley, is more of an, a mathematician, but has really been helping with pulling together the sort of the big business communication stuff um, for getting the at scale production. 
And yeah, we're thinking about making something, Toma, called the Z to A cooperative for Zef to Ali. <laughs> 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 and I really did want to talk about how great it would be if Bits could make an IRB and stuff, but I didn't get a chance. So yeah. yes, yes, we we have we have, so many things came out of this and creative community, but but uh, um, like the fact that. Uh, as you said, there is a need for helping, support, supporting um, the translation of the technology that were, uh, you know, invented by the community and making them into products. Um, and so far, there is no easy way for a community project to get to that point. So uh, we are currently working on that aspect. And uh, yeah, if you are quite a tight rope, I think we, we will manage it hopefully for some. Yes, I, I think so too. Another another aspect that as we have been touching also um, is the fact that um, being able to provide an evaluation framework for the community um, and uh, it's obviously it's been variable, but there is a very specific kind of evaluation that is called uh, an RRB. Um, and uh, Remind me what it what it stands for. <laughs> institutional Research Board. No, Institutional Review Board. Review Board. Thank you. So they're uh, especially for human um, studies. Exactly, and so it's a mandatory step for a lot of projects that are working with uh, with humans or humans data, um, and uh, and so it's mostly uh, about. Um, Know, reviewing if 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 the the rules of the basic rule of ethics are being um, you know conserved uh, and uh, and being able to provide such a framework to um, a distributed community like like the DIY by your community which is a very active community has many projects many ideas would be actually quite re revolutionary because it would bring them to a, a, another step of quality um, so uh, this is also something we've been working on uh, so if you are yourself listening to this message. Uh, definitely join us uh, if you want to help us do that. Um, I think that uh, the Africa panel is late. <laughs> um, um, Paige, uh, are you here? Maybe not. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Africa panel right now and tell them to, uh, to stop and uh, and uh, and come back here. So see you uh, in just a bit. Hey, initiative. Um, I'd like to thank um, all of our panelists as well. You've given us some great words. Uh, you said get out of the lab, go into the community, uh, and make impact. So very important. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists: uh, Joy Owango from TCC Africa, Harry Akligo from the Hive Bio Lab. Right, I will do. <laughs> but now I'm uh, downstairs. Oh. So I'm from Leverkusen. Where are you from? You know Leverkusen in Germany? It's on oh. the other side of the Rhine from Cologne. And we are Chen Park City here. <laughs> We used to have Bayer and now it's a Chem Park and we have Bayer, Covesto and a lot of Langsess you may know and a lot of big companies here. And we have a lot of problems with the Rhine flooding. Mm. So uh, we have a very old uh, port at the Rhine which is about a thousand years old. It's called Hittorf. And in this Haber we had two big floods and then they have a plan. Germany always makes plan. So for the COVID, I did a Rücklauf plan. It's called a backup plan, which is from the Schifffahrt Ministerium and Amts for the waterways in Germany. So we always have a, a backup plan. We can check up it with analog. And right. so there, where we get the water, the wastewater over to the so, Rhine. We have we're going to, yeah, we're going to start, to yeah. To protect your port from three, three meters flooding, you need a 30 meter downwards wall, wall to get up the groundwater. Otherwise, uh, you've got a problem. Okay, so we're going to start the, the, the event again. Um, Thank you again for all the panelists. Uh, 
I'm sure I'm sure the panel on Africa was uh, absolutely awesome too. Uh, we had really a great time. Um, everything is being recorded, so there will be videos shared on uh, on social media and on YouTube, um, so that you can you can look at it again or you can share it also to your own community. Um, and you know, before before we end this uh, celebration, uh, I really wanted to uh, to say thank you again. Um, because this is this is an adventure that wouldn't have been possible um, without you, but it wouldn't have been possible also without the Drugo team. And so um, I would like to also to celebrate um, the amazing team that we have the chance to work with. Uh, everyone is really, uh, I mean, the Drugo team is quite special in the sense that everybody, we, we are a distributed team. And um, so, um, it since for 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 month now for for a year and a half, um, you know, before the COVID started, we were all based mostly in Paris. Uh, but after after the COVID, uh, we started actually well um, enlarging our, our our scope. Also, we started working with people from different continents. We then hired uh, people from different continents, and now we're. Uh, you know the team is the, the, the people of the Drogo team are in eight different countries and uh, in four different continents, uh, and so it's 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 we basically apply the same rules uh, to us than the community the Drogo community is using, um, and so it teaches us also about the kind of dynamics that we, that are cool to apply for community animation. Um, so so yeah, um, you know you you heard about Gemini, uh, we have Juliet, you heard about Leo. Lucy, Brad, um, Chris, Luca, Max, Mariana, Paige, Mark, Anthony, and Jill. Uh, those are the current member of the team, but there is also uh, all the other members of the team who are not part of the Drogo team currently, but have been part of what is Drogo today, especially in the next, in, sorry, in the past 12 months. Um, and so it's, it's Kat, it's Nathan, it's Kate, Alex, it's Corey, it's Isabel, Luis, Janet, and Elliot. Uh, so thank you so much, guys. Uh, this is, I mean, this is such a, an ambitious and complex project and um, none of this would have been possible with all of you. Uh, we're so, so, so lucky to have such a beautiful team. Um, um, and so obviously the next part is to thank our key partners. Uh, what makes Drogo running uh, today and we uh, you know first of all the AXA research fund has been um, truly uh, a key 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 partner since the the very very early stage of the development of self drugal they've been we've been uh, working with them discussing with them even before covid uh, as we've been work, discussing about how to to uh, to help open science in uh, in africa then covid hit and they were extremely fast uh, to support us um, and they've been doing so since then. So uh, truly, 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 uh, thank you to the AXA Research Fund. Uh, and then we have the AFD, the Agence Française de Développement, also who has been uh, truly, uh, you know, listening to the kind of mission that we're developing, especially for, uh, for open science in, uh, in developing countries. So thank you, AFD, again. Um, the, before, before we say goodbye, a, a reminder of our next events, uh, the next global community call is happening in one week from now, on July 14th. Uh, and then you heard about it from Gameli. We have the launch of Drogo Africa on the July 21st. And also after the summer, the mm -hmm. launch of a new program around cancer. It's called Epidemium. It's the third season. Uh, Epidemium is something that we're quite familiar uh, at Jogo, because with uh, Matthew and myself, the three co-founders of, of Jogo, it's actually a program that we've been working on before Jogo. Um, and so we are very happy actually to see it coming now on, on, onto Jogo. It's like the, the, the cycle is complete. Uh, and so there will be more information on September 9th. Um, and thank you again. <laughs> uh, so yeah, happy birthday, Jogo. Uh, it's been it's been an amazing uh, adventure in the past two years, and I cannot imagine I cannot start imagining uh, what's going to happen in the next few years, especially in the next five months. We have so much uh, packed uh, in our luggages that we want to develop. We have so much ideas. Uh, we want to work with all of you uh, to make it happen. 
Um, and uh, if you want to help us, if you want to, uh, to work with us, do not hesitate. Come to us uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we change, uh, we change the way uh, science innovation is being done. Um, thank you again. And I hope to see you all very soon. However, this is not the end. As I told you, we have a special event for after IGM. So if you're interested in staying like I will do uh, to hear more about after IGM that is coming on to Jogo and especially about synthetic biology, stay with us. Uh, we'll take uh, a couple of minutes break and, uh, and then Dorothy will take um, the following. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.